my name is Professor David Andrew Tizard, and this is the first lecture on a course entitled Modern Issues in Korea. Uh, during this course, we'll be looking at a variety of things uh, that affect life here in Seoul, South Korea in 2020. Issues, uh, environmental issues such as uh, Mise Monji, Fine Dust, um, political issues such as North and South Korea relations as well as perhaps Korea and Japanese relations. They're very important in modern Korea. We'll be looking at some cultural and social issues, uh, things that we'll tackle, uh, things related to Kaptil, uh, the abuse of power which has come up a lot recently in the news. Also things of maybe more a sexual nature where we'll look at things such as abortion, uh, the rise of LGBTQI plus issues, uh, homosexuality, the birth rate, all of these things that uh, you see in the newspapers every day. So that's what we'll be covering. Uh, the purpose of today's lesson is just to give you a, a little bit of an introduction into what we mean by modern Korea to try to stimulate your brains towards this conception of modernity, just very briefly. Uh, then we'll look at one short essay. We'll take some bits uh, from this essay, having a look at identity. What is the identity of Korea? Once this is all uh, finished, uh, I'll ask you to complete an assignment based on today's lesson. I won't give too much more introduction or information here. I'll do some of that at the end. Um, but for now, let's get straight into uh, this lesson on modern Korea. Now, before engaging in a study of modern Korea, we need to know where it has come from. So if, if we consider that 2020 is modern Korea, what does that mean and what came before that? So when wasn't modern Korea? For example, we might know that the Joseon dynasty was uh, 1392 until 1897 or 1905, whenever the cutoff point that you choose is. So was that traditional Korea and modern Korea started? Well, it kind of started then because then you had the Japanese occupation from, say, 1910 to 1945. So that technically really couldn't have been Korea or even modern Korea. Uh, we know that the U.S. government ruled the southern half of the Korean peninsula uh, from 1945 until 1948. So, again... That can't have been it. So does modern Korea begin in 1948? Is that the birth of it with, you know, Lee Sung man as the first uh, the president of the Republic of Korea? It depends how you define Korea. If you take it on a relative scale from, you know, the, the first dynasties, if you go back a couple of thousand years and you take Korean history from its inception until now, on that large time scale, you might say that Yes, modern Korea began in 1945. Before that was occupy uh, 1948. Sorry, before that was occupation, and before that was the Joseon Dynasty, which is traditional Korea. Okay, that would make sense. You could make an argument for that, perhaps. But if you were to compare 1948 South Korea with 2020 South Korea the differences would be so great that it would be hard to see them as both modern Korea. It would be hard to see them as both the similar thing or under the same umbrella, I think. So 1948 doesn't seem like an appropriate demarcation point to say modern Korea began then. Of course, we know with um, First President Lee Sung man very authoritarian, very anti-communist. Then you had the coup d'etat. Uh, Park Chung-hee coming in uh, first as a military general and then as a civilian president after that, but always with that strong association with the military uh, from 1960 until 1979. Another coup uh, with General Chan do -hun. And it wasn't until 1987, following a series of, uh, you had uh, protests, you know, um, 1980 Gwangju, uh, 1987 as well, the rise of the Minjung movement, where people sort of became political. People developed a political identity away from the state through this Minjung movement that you might start seeing what you think of modern Korea. 
1987, you had Noteu uh, coming into power. Again, one of Chen uh cohorts in, in that general clique and part of the coup. Uh, he did sort of mark a bit of a change. 1992, you had Kim Yong-sam coming in. But Kim Yong-sam ran with Kim Jong-pil. So he ran under the conservative banner. So in that sense, there was still no opposition in power. It was still very much a one party or one uh, sort of like one stream that you could pull, at least from Park chang until the end of Kim Yong-sam, debatably. Kim Dae-jung was the first time that the opposition had come into power in South Korea. And if you consider that democracy is when a party uh, gives up power to the opposition peacefully, then you might consider uh, 1997, Kim Dae-jung coming into power, as being the start of modern Korea. Not just because Kim Dae-jung represented, let's say, the progressive side of Korean politics, even if it were the other way round, you still had the passing of power uh, peacefully between political parties. That might be considered Korea's entrance into the modern world or modern Korea. But then again, in 2002, South Korean society was still very Confucian, uh, attitudes towards um, multiculturalism, towards things like homosexuality, to things like abortion. They were still, by today's terms anyway, they would still seem very, very traditional. So politically, it might have becoming modern around that time, 2002, but maybe socially and culturally, it still wasn't quite there. Is it modern now? This is what we have trouble with, and there's no clear answer on this. It, it depends how you want to approach this. And first of all, it, it comes down to how do you define modernity, which aspect or which perspective are you going to take on defining Korean modernity and there'll be many lenses that you'll explore so how do you define modernity and then apply that apply that definition that understanding that will be a theoretical framework to the history and development of Korea and then you might be able to you know point off or demarcate elements of when you think that modern Korea began and once you have that, then you might be able to draw other lines and say, well, if this is modern Korea, then you might say that this is pre-modern Korea or the dawn of modern Korea. You might be even able to look at things like post-modern Korea if you believe that post-modernity ever arrives or, or can come. So before we even start issues in modern Korea, please think about when did modern Korea begin? Has it begun? What caused it to begin? You know, think about those ideas and you hopefully develop those over this course. So that's the first thing that I would like you to consider. Now, as we go through and I said we're going to look at issues such as gabdil, abortion, uh, gay rights issues, um, feminism, all of these things that really are prominent in modern uh, Korean culture and news and society and discussion these days it's going to be natural that when we look at what's happening in korea people are going to compare it with what's happening in say western europe or north america they might look at examples from uh, north america canada and the united states or western europe uh, the united kingdom germany france and say well over there this is what happens in those countries uh, Gay marriage has been legalized. These things are completely acceptable. But in South Korea, we still don't, people still don't have those rights, those freedoms. These things still haven't developed. Now, as we do that, and it's natural that that will happen and different people will do it positively. And some people will say that that's a negative thing. You need to consider this. Is it acceptable for us to compare cultures across time and space like that should we be comparing uh, south korea 2020 with i don't know france 2020 to see where how modernity is coming up you know how do we place modern korea in the global sphere how do we compare it and is it acceptable to do that can we learn from that can we draw any lessons from comparing it or does comparing cultures become very problematic and very troublesome it's a, 
we generally, a lot of people I would say, have a great resistance to comparing cultures. They find it very easy to compare music, uh, to compare sports teams, to compare movies, to compare books, to, to make rankings and listings uh, of all of these kind of things based on these and they talk about it for days. Uh, but as soon as it comes to comparing culture, there is this very strong aversion that that shouldn't take place. It used to take place. Uh, a lot of people would rank cultures in, you know, uh, in terms of how developed they were. That doesn't seem to be uh, as part of the generally accepted discourse these days. I have to think why that is and how do you feel about comparing modern South Korea to what might be other modern countries and if you do that would you say that some countries are more modern than others would you say south korea is more modern than north korea in some ways you might think well, yes there are arguments to be made for that so if then south korea is modern what would that make north korea what would that make various other countries so how do you feel about this idea of comparing cultures in terms of modernity across space also, is it possible to compare modern Korea with pre-modern Korea or Korea before that? So if you find it uncomfortable to compare across cultures, to compare Korea with another country, how do you feel about the idea of comparing Korea with itself at different times? So essentially it's the same culture or it's the same people, but you're comparing it then across time generally into the past can you say that modern korea is better than the joseon dynasty or the Shilla dynasty is that an acceptable thing does that make sense to you because that's how we would get the idea of modernity you know comparing is often very useful if we have a pen for example we have no idea if this pen is big or small until we compare it with another pen otherwise it's just a pen we need to place it in a context before we realize, well, the pen is actually quite thick. And I never would have thought of that until you hold it up to another pen. It's actually fairly shorter as well. Not to say it's better or worse, but that's how you might realize that comparisons help you see things more clearly. So can we compare it with the past? Might seem like a silly question, but a lot of people do that. That's why we have terms in modern society like OK Boomer or Latin and Malia back in my day. You know, people always compare with the past and I'm sure uh, you will at some point too. Uh, the third question uh, on here, uh, I'm looking at this one. When we analyze a culture, a, an, an entity, a concept such as modern Korea, will every answer and definition be different according to whom we ask so when we're saying what is modern korea and is modern korea good how can we get to grips with this concept will we get a different answer from the young people the old people the koreans the foreigners the men the women the rich and the poor will they all have a different interpretation of what modern korea is and how will those interpretations differ? So how, for example, will the elderly generation, we know that Korea is an aging population. It's a very low birth rate. Uh, a lot of senior people here, it's really getting old. So how do these people, this generation of, you know, people in their 60s and 70s, how do they see Korea 2020 compared to people like yourself, young university students in your early 20s, the career is the same thing, but the perception is different. The perception is based on age. So do these two ages see this same concept differently? How and why? What are those differences? That's based on age. You might find people in their 20s, the men and the women, they also see modern career differently. So are we always going to run into a problem that if everybody sees this thing as modern career differently, we're trying to uh, pick up soup with our hands and it's always running through. We can't, you know, really grasp this thing that we're trying to analyze. Or can we make a consensus and we say, well, this is what 
South Korea is or modern Korea is because we can collect all the various views and then try to say, well, this is the one that I think has the most uh, credence or this is the most appropriate, the most accurate according to it. So you want to think about that. Can we find definitive answers to what modern Korea is, what modern Korea means? One of the really important things um, trying to explain Korea to foreigners, to people outside of Korea, when I teach international students, uh, when they visit uh, South Korea, one of the first things I have to explain is that Korea is not a monolith. You know, if you say Korea is a conservative country, but then there are examples when it's not. And you can say Korea uh, is, you know, very vibrant, but then it's not. Korea is not just one thing. It's a great many number of things. So we need to see what's dominating or what is prominent. We also need to be aware of our own ideologies and our own perspectives when we look at Korea because we might be seeing what we want to see or we might be seeing our perspective but then missing the perspective of other people and it's all those perspectives together that create this thing called modern Korea. It's very easy to be blinded by your own ideology and there's a, uh, a saying or a quote about ideology which says ideology is like breath you cannot smell your own. You can smell other people's quite easily. You know, if they've been drinking coffee, if they've been smoking, eating garlic or these things, you can sense it. But it's very hard to gauge your own. It's the same with ideology. You can see when you think other people or other people are, you know, very conservative, very progressive, very feminist, very anti-feminist, uh, all of these type of things, very pro-North Korea, anti you you can see that but it's very hard to see your own so that's one of the challenges as you go through this course on modern korea to not only understand what it is but understand how you see it in relation to other people now we'll go through a lot of theories this is just the last point that i i want to raise uh in this particular section we'll go through lots of theories on what modernity means we'll have a look at maybe uh, liquid modernity by Bauman. We have to have a look at post-modernity, these different concepts. But what does modernity mean? If we take it out of that career context and we say, what does modernity mean? What is a symbol of modernity? Now, one of the simpler answers would be that Korea is a modern country because it has excellent broadband. It has, you know, smartphone technology. Everybody has them connected on subways, connected on buses. You can access these things at all times. Uh, public toilets and, and health places, they're generally quite clean. I know they might not be considered very safe uh, for female population primarily. Um, there are coffee shops, Starbucks. We might look at this and see this is a modern country and before there weren't all these Starbucks and smartphones and things like that. It didn't feel as modern. So some people would see modernity as material development, that the stages of a country uh, progress, they go through based on material development. One of the proponents of this idea, uh, some people would say would be Karl Marx, who saw the development of history, the stages of history being uh, driven by economic, by money, right, which is a material thing, essentially, uh, that it's material things that drive history forward, that drive the narrative of a country. And that's what pushes you through the stages. So is it the material technological developments that take you through? In contrast, there's another way of looking at modernity. Uh, the German sociologist, Max Weber, he said that modernity was more a state of mind. So it was it's this word here. Ideational looks weird, but if you just take out this, right, you can see this word. Idea. Modernity is an idea. So the idea of modernity is when you challenge authority, is when you question things. This is according to Max Weber in general. In traditional societies, before modernity, you had traditional societies. 
And in traditional societies, people didn't challenge authority and they didn't question things. They didn't challenge authority because the king was the king or the duke was the duke and they were more powerful. There was no equality between people. There was no idea of a you know, horizontal status. The hierarchy was very strong. So there was no challenging of authority in traditional societies. Moreover, there was no questioning of things. There was no questioning why do we do that every year? What's the point of it? What's the purpose? People just accept things for what they are and they preserve, they conserve the status quo and let things continue. I'm not saying that this is a good or a bad thing and it wasn't always exactly like that, but that was one of the general characteristics of a traditional society, not challenging, not challenging authority, not questioning why things were, why things are, why, why do we exist, why do we live, why does the sun go up, the sun doesn't go up, the earth goes round, all of these questions that come in. So you can imagine in a situation, if you look at, say, some images, or if you look at video of North Korea, Pyongyang looks like quite a modern city at times. You might think the fashion is a little bit strange, but when it has its subway, the people use smartphones, not connected to the internet, but an intranet. Uh, they use the subway, they have smartphones, the streets are clean, the apartments are tall. You know, they have some TV, not a great deal of electricity all the time. Theme parks, shops, department stores. Pyongyang for the elites, the, the elites, the, the Yangban or the people with high songbun in North Korea, they live very well. Obviously, the countryside is, is very, very different. But uh, looking at Pyongyang, you would visually say that looks like a, a modern city. It looks like a modern Asian city. From a material perspective, you could almost argue that, I think. If you were to take an ideational perspective and you were to say if modernity is a state of mind, modernity is when you question, then you might say that, no, North Korea is not modern because... The people there don't have as much, say, autonomy. They don't act as freely, rather they act in a way that is directed and governed by the state. It's not to say one is good or one is bad, but it's clearly very different from what we see in South Korea, where citizens are able to uh, be subjective actors. You're allowed to go onto SNS, onto Twitter, onto Insta, TikTok, Facebook, cacao story and you're allowed to give your opinions on anything on covid on president moon hwang gyo an chogul bts you're allowed to be an autonomous subjective person in this history maybe that's what modernity is it's but then the next step just to continue this the next step would not just be having that freedom the next step would be using that freedom because it can be very scary. You know, there, there are ideas, um, you know, in liquid modernity that we like to be controlled. We like to have things shaped for us so that we don't move out. Having that freedom can be quite disorientating because if traditionalism all goes away, then we're left standing on nothing except for ourselves. And that can be a very disorienting uh thing to consider so is modernity defined by material technological development or is it defined by ideational development in where people start questioning and challenging authority is this ideational concept of modernity too eurocentric is that too much of a western basis of modernity and that doesn't quite fit into asia you need an asian idea of modernity that's another good way of thinking about that that might have some fruit if you investigate that also you'll probably understand that maybe it's not just uh, binary like yes or no maybe there are degrees of it maybe it needs some material development and some ideational development for modernity to take place maybe that's where that goes so issues we're going to look at the issues, but issues in modern Korea, just taking those two words apart, modern 
career that should take you some time to first of all start questioning what that means so i'd encourage you to go and uh, do a little bit of reading or more importantly maybe do a little bit of thinking about what modern career means and what it doesn't mean because if you can define modern career if my writing looks bad i'm using a mouse here rather than a pen so uh, please forgive me but if you can define modern career as being all of this then you'll know that all of this isn't modern career so you'll have defined something else uh, please consider those things for me and I learn how to press my buttons okay so um, we're gonna have a look at some of the ideas in this first uh, article today it deals with cultural policy which I'm not as much interested in for today's lesson uh, it's more about cultural identity okay that's a really key question we're just going to sort of introduce it a little bit uh, but to give us some things to think about going forward so this is 2002 so it's quite dated this article that we're starting with however it's you know it's good to get some perspective of where things were so I have no problem with that as we read through it find things that you understand you don't have to understand everything you want to find you know if you can find one line per paragraph you get that that makes sense to you great underline it get that get some things that you understand and you also want to be thinking about what do you agree or what do you disagree with you need to be thinking critically about this this is one person's paper I haven't chosen it because everything in it is correct or it's amazing. I've chosen it because I want you to start looking and thinking about ideas as we build towards modern career. If you haven't read this paper yet, I would advise you to maybe stop this video and just go and read a little bit of it by yourself. Because if you do that, you will see your things in the paper. You will see things that stick out and jump out to you. You'll be confused and you won't get a lot of it, but there'll be bits that you go, okay, and that will be your work. That will be something that you have done rather than me showing you everything because we'll see different things. You will see things that I won't see and I will see things that you don't see. So by doing it that way, you'll have a more complete understanding of this than if you just listen uh, to me. So we'll have a look now, we'll start now. Cultural identity and cultural policy in South Korea by Hak Sun Yim. Um, it begins with the evolution of cultural policy in South Korea. There has been an associated change in cultural policy objectives. These primarily concerned with establishing cultural identity, the development of culture and the arts, the promotion of the quality of cultural life and the fostering of cultural industries. However, as a whole, since the establishment of the First Republic of 1948, the foremost challenge of Korean cultural policy has been to resolve the issue of cultural identity. Really key thing to try to consider. What is Korea's cultural identity? What is Korea? If Korea looks in the mirror and sees itself, what does it see? What is Korea's identity? It's been trying to deal with this issue for a long time for a, a great many years and for many reasons so when we said uh, what is modern korea has it arrived yet maybe korea itself doesn't know maybe you can try to answer that continuing as yesu kim observes until the late 1970s the construction of cultural identity provided perhaps the most significant rationale for cultural policy with regard to this characteristic of Korean cultural policy, it is instructive to identify why the issue of cultural identity has been considered important and furthermore, to what extent this issue has actually affected cultural policy. Uh, let's, let's go down. This is a little bit of introduction. It, it doesn't say much, okay? Um, starting here. The issue of cultural identity, this is the focus that I want to get from this paper. The issue of cultural identity first arose from the sense of cultural discontinuity between Korean traditional culture and contemporary culture owing to the influence of Japanese colonialism, the divided Korea, the Korean War, rapid modernization 
and the apparently indiscriminate influx of Western culture. We'll come to this. Given these various circumstances, Korean traditional culture has tended to become eroded and swiftly transformed and, furthermore, to some extent has given way to Western culture in terms of the way of life of the people. So, The issue of Korean cultural identity. What is Korean culture? What is Korea? It's a very difficult and profound question to try to get to grips with because perhaps you've never thought about it. You've lived here your whole life. You've spent some time abroad perhaps, but you take it for granted. You take the concept of Korea for granted. It's always been there. It's, it's always there. But Korea is an idea. So if you take a constructivist approach, which would be like uh, in, in Korean, a constructive approach, the ideas of, say, Alexander Vent, or if you looked at Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities, uh, Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities is a good book on this subject. Uh, Berger and Lookman's The Social Construction of Reality is more difficult. It's 1960s, but some great ideas in there. You come across this idea that nations are constructions. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, if you look out the window right now, you can see maybe trees, buildings, maybe mountains, cars, buses, roads. All of these are physical things. You can see the cars and they're moving and you can see the buildings and you can see the mountains and you can see the sky, the sun, maybe the stars if it's late. You can see these things because they're physically there. Okay. Now, if you look out that window, you cannot see Korea. You cannot see Dehamingu. You see all these other things, but Korea, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, Dehamingu, it has many different names, which makes it more difficult. That doesn't exist in the physical world. That exists as an idea in people's minds, not just one person's mind. If it only existed in one person's mind, it wouldn't really have much power or much authority. It's a collective idea. It's an idea that everybody believes and that's what gives it power. It is an imagined community. This is the title of Benedict Anderson's book, that the idea that the nation is something that is imagined collectively and therefore it is shaped. You can't really change the shape of a car or a building just through your thoughts. You know, physically you can go up to these things and mold them and hit them and prod, prod them and do these things, but they exist physically. However, with ideas or concepts, and if you hold that South Korea is an idea, then that idea can change. That idea can be shaped. Well, this idea is getting a bit dangerous. We need to consider this. The ideas can change according to who writes the ideas, who makes the ideas. Then you're getting into more Foucauldian, uh, Michel Foucault, analysis of power and things like that. But we're getting a little bit off track. One of the ideas that I've just given you is that Korea is an idea. It's an imagined community because it doesn't exist physically. The problems with cultural identity arose from the sense of here we have cultural discontinuity. So with with you know some countries that they're, they're lucky because you can see a linear line. You know there will be all of these things and they go here and they have developments at different stages but it's one linear line. Now, in a sense with Korea, it's a little bit troubled because yes, it had its um, its dynasties, Goguryeo, Shilo, Joseon, but then it kind of stopped and there was a gap, yeah? Now, this gap is debatable. Many people say there was not a gap, that Korea continued. Obviously, you had the uh, the government in Shanghai of 1919, different things, that was the continuation. The, the story of Korea's history and past is still being argued. Yeah? It's still being debated. You'll see that in political ways, uh, the Progressive Party, 
the progressive side in i should say more well, they're not progressive the the not right side the progressive side they prefer to put korea's history as beginning from 1945 because then that signals the defeat the end of japan they also like to try to put it back to 1919 because the older it is the more authenticity it has of being old you find that the right wing the conservatives they really try to focus on uh, 1948 so when you have this date What year does it refer to? August 15th. What year does it refer to? Different people will give you different answers. The reason they will give you different answers is because this is still being debated. It's not being debated, but it's still, there's a battle to see whether uh, August 15th refers to 1945 and liberation from Japan or it refers to 1948, which is officially the start of Republic of Korea as a legal entity. If you're looking sort of legally, the Republic of Korea starts in uh, 1948, not in 1945. So when this uh, number comes is a very interesting thing. It's talking here about cultural discontinuity because it seems like, you know, the point that I was trying to make physically, there might be gaps where Korea wasn't quite there and that's a very difficult thing you know the, the the past is not a nice thing to look at because it doesn't tell you what you want to to see sometimes so the problem of cultural identity some things that really affect it of course we've just mentioned Japanese colonialism the divided Korea so Korea is one thing but that is split between north and south and has been that way since 1945 the korean war the rapid modernization and the influx of western culture now western culture has been something debated here for a long time um with sohak and donghak the donghak rebellion or donghak uprising which kind of led on to the gabo reforms and uh, all of these the end of slavery um but a lot of things are affecting cultural identity of Korea. Korea, you would think, is working out who it is. It's looking in the mirror a little bit more. So let's let's continue and see what we can get there. Um, reading. Thus, in order to identify what causes the issue of cultural identity to be so central to cultural policy, it is necessary to mention first the characteristics of Korean traditional culture we're getting the opposite of modernity would be traditional one of korea's most striking characteristics has been its long and continuous existence as a unified country in spite of numerous invasions and occupations the koreans have remained remarkably homogenous and have been termed hanminjo meaning korean nation furthermore despite korea being divided the national conscious constructed by hanminjo has remained as eckhart at all point out this characteristic has become an essential base for modern Korean nationalism, developing as it did in reaction to foreign imperialism and occupation during the late 19th and 20th centuries. This cultural nationalism has indeed provided a significant background to Korean cultural identity policy. It is for this reason that multiculturalism based on various ethnic groups need not be considered in Korean cultural policy. And see the strength of that words there in 2002 and how much uh, might be changing now traditional korean culture it's uh suggested here and this is what the paper says you understand it and then criticize or analyze as you see fit please um despite of numerous invasions and occupations uh, some historians disagree with this uh, Mark Peterson is one uh, historian that says Korea's history has been very peaceful, actually. You know, you've had uh, two Japanese invasions, one in the 1500s and then in the early 1900s. But other than that, you know, compared to Europe, if you look at all the wars and the, the interfighting that happened in Europe, compared to Europe, uh, South Korea's history is actually quite peaceful. Yeah, it was quite st stable, quite static. 
but there's this idea of playing up Korea as the the shrimp between whales, you know, that gets its back broken, that's always being invaded, poor Korea. Why is that narrative pushed sometimes? Well, that's pushed sometimes because one suggestion would be that then it can play the morally superior card. It can say, well, we've been invaded and we, we've been hard done by, so now we can have the moral right to do what we want. So you need to consider that Korean history or traditional Korea, traditional Korea can be seen as very peaceful or it can be seen as very turbulent. And depending which history books you read, which historians you cover, you'll get two different interpretations of what traditional Korea was. You also get this term of Han Min Jok. Um, it's remained remarkably homogenous. Yes, uh, of course, much more than many other countries. But, you know, Han Min Jok was uh, a term essentially created by Shin Tae Ho. Uh, Shin Tae Ho created or gave this idea of Han Min Jok or Min Jok um, because he wanted to start telling the story of Korea not through the kings and the queens, but through the people themselves, through the nation rather than the court. So before that, the history of Korea uh, was written, or the history of Chosun was written as such as this king lived, then this king died, and then this king lived, and this king killed this king, and then this king died, this king was crazy, this prince put in a box. History was only the stories of the kings and the queens. The king is dead, long live the king, that kind of thing. So it was Shin Chae Ho uh, that came up with this idea or gave birth to the idea of a minjok, the the people, the min you still see in gukmin in South Korea, those gukmin for citizens in uh, North Korea, in min, and jok coming from uh, kajok. But it's, it's really kind of a more modern term when Shin Chae Ho created this. So the people as a family, to build this idea, this is, you know, imagined communities again, to take history away from the kings and queens and give it to the people. Now, the reason Shin Chae Ho was doing this, there are a couple of reasons. One, obviously, because uh, it was the time of imperialism. It was said that somewhere. Um, but great powers, Japan, Russia, China, America, Great Britain, they were all looking at this area trying to work out who is going to have what. And so if Korea was not unified, it wouldn't be able to defend against any of these people coming in. So one of the reasons that it had to create this minjok, this sense of collective identity, was because of imperial things. Shin Chae Ho also wanted to claim Manchuria, uh, Mancho, uh, Manju. He wanted that area. So, you know, he, he also had that element of uh, reclaiming, extending territory for Korea. Um, so this idea of Minjok as uh, an imagined thing from Shin Chae Ho, the Japanese actually, some Japanese historians actually agreed and also promoted this idea of Minjok because they believed that if Korea was united under this Minjok concept, then it would be easier to colonize. It would be easier to colonize the people that were united than rather a people that were divided. So there were even some uh, Japanese historians at the time that supported Shin Chae Ho's work on bringing Korean people together as a minjok. Obviously, uh, minjok has been used by politicians throughout. Uh, Park Chung-hee used it quite a lot. This idea uh, of minjok, uri minjok, we are one people. We are not a a political thing, but we are a people. Uh, when President Moon Jae-in went to Pyongyang, uh, he went to the mass games, the sort of Arirang games with uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un. There's sort of 100,000 people in there. And uh, giving a speech to the 100,000 people in Pyongyang, uh, President Moon Jae-in said, Uri min usuhada. And if you translate that, it gets a bit weird, but our people are, our race is superior. That can sound quite difficult for Western people to hear. You can imagine if uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, uh, Angela Merkel, Donald Trump, if, if any of their people, uh, world leaders said our race, our people are superior, it would start getting a little bit weird. But that's what happens here. Minjok is still used by some people. 
the word that President Moon has used most in his meetings with Chairman Kim Jong-un, I believe, is Minjok. It's what they're basing this necessity of reunification is based on the idea of we are one people. That also might be the thing that divides them. Some scholars will say that this idea of focusing on one one nation, one people, uh, causes problems. Think about that. Are they one nation? Are South Korea and North Korea still one people? It depends how you define people. Are people defined genetically? Are people defined culturally? As South Korea becomes more multicultural uh, with you know, foreign residents, multicultural families, I have to two children and they're they're half korean half british i mean what words do you want to use to describe those how does that affect the minjok so is the minjok still a thing in modern korea or is it old because you know some people still use it one thing that's not uh, mentioned here is the minjung uh, as opposed to the minjok so the minjung is more the people as a political not a historical but a political subjectivity so in the it came from the protest in the 1960s the starting point from busan and masan but then as it got up into 1980 1987 you had this uh, political rising up where the people said that we are people we have rights we don't want to just live under the state we want political representation and we are oppressed. The people realize their position of being oppressed, of being underneath, and then challenged that oppression. They challenged that. So where North Korea and South Korea might share the same concepts on Minjo, uh, traditionally, the Minjung is specific to South Korea. Because that rise of the people, that rise of the people to say we are oppressed and we're going to challenge the state, we are autonomous beings in uh, this historical narrative and we can control things, that you would say hasn't really happened in North Korea. There have been talks of a few coup d'etats and assassination attempts which obviously ultimately failed, but there hasn't been that political uprising of the people but there was in South Korea, there was the Minjung movement, and that did happen, you know, promoted and prompted by people like John Dae-il uh, and things like that, but it did come up. So in terms of what is Korea, what is modern Korea, is, is Minjok part of modern Korea, or is that still traditional Korea and the Minjung became modern Korea? How does that go across? So some more ideas there for you to consider. Um going down. On the other hand, it is important to consider traditional culture and the strength of influence of Confucianism, the ruling ideology of the Joseon dynasty. Due to the influence of Confucianism, the Joseon dynasty emphasized humanity, ethical morality, and spiritual self-cultivation, and furthermore valued spiritual over material life. Other values of Confucianism, such as virtue, harmony, faithfulness, propriety, righteousness, and loyalty, were also considered to be important during the Joseon dynasty. In line with this, spiritual culture and academic knowledge were broadly preferred to commerce and technology. The arts have thus come to be seen as an integral, integral part of cultivating morality. So uh, ideas that were uh, prevalent or promoted by Confucianism, um, you know, one of the main ones was this, which would be Ren or Zen in, in Korean, it's kind of in, like this. It's really hard to write like this. Yeah, uh, You know, this human-heartedness, this be benevolence. <laughs> Thank you, brain, for helping me there. And what you notice from this concept is, you know, this, this kind of shiot, this is a person, and this is the number two. And that goodness comes when people exist in harmony with each other, when they fulfill their relations to each other, the big brother and the little brother, the husband and the wife, you've got to exist in uh, in harmony, in concert with other people. That's the very opposite of individualism. That's the very opposite of sabasa. I think sabasa is uh, a, a wonderful concept, not because of what it uh, what it says, but because 
it shows you that career is changing. Sabasa, saram, saram by saram, person by person, coming from kebak, case by case. But this sabasa is kind of new. Sabasa is quite new. People didn't say sabasa before. If there was a a hueshik or things like that, people didn't want to go to these company dinners or meetings or MTs. They had to go because they had an obligation. There was a collective thing, you know. There was the group. There was this you do things together. But Sabasa came along and they sort of realized, well, let's let people do what they want according to each individual. There's no standard or kijun. It's just Sabasa. Now, this had been long and well understood. I'm not saying it's better, but this had been long and well understood in other places. But for Koreans, it's been interesting to see this come in maybe the last year or 18 months. Of course, it was there before then, but it never had a word as much. It never had a concept or a term. And it's only when things are named that then they become more into reality. They can exist before, but instill their they're quantified, codified, given a name so that people can recognize it becomes an idea. Then it becomes something. So Sabasa is uh, very interesting. So you might have modernity uh, and traditionalism over here. Um, other values, it points out harmony, faithfulness, propriety, loyalty. Um, so you would have, well, that's a really bad here. Right. You would have your. You would have yeah. Uh, filial piety uh, in English, filial piety would be here. Yeah, would be propriety. Now, these values of doing what your parents say, right? Very Confucian value. To be a good Confucian, you have to follow what your parents say because they gave birth to you. You're not really meant to have tattoos because they gave you your body. When they die, you're not meant to uh, cut your fingernails or your hair for three years because, again, they were given to you. So, yo was or filial piety was a very big part of traditional Korean culture. So as that disappears, does that signal that traditional culture is disappearing and modernity is coming to replace it? And with yeah, yeah, the idea of propriety, the idea that things have to be done well, that you have to with two hands and bow properly and, and put things in the place as that as these things go, is that what brings modernity? Are these the things that block modernity? Or are these the things that modernity will have to stand on top on, on top of? Yeah. Do we need to get rid of these things for modernity to come up? Or do we sit on top of these things, integrate them? Like there's this idea for, called uh, integral thinking by Ken Wilber where the new ideas have to integrate the old ideas. They can't get rid of them because then you're left again in this vacuum. Do they integrate these older traditional ideas? Do these traditional ideas, can they work in modernity? Can Confucianism and modernity work together when modernity espouse values such as these and modernity has other values that it looks at? There's something to consider. Um, uh, and of course, when we say Confucianism, we might all also want to consider it, that it's Neo-Confucianism because it was uh, it was in the later part of the Chosun dynasty that Confucianism became more patriarchal, that it became, you know, it, it took away women's rights to inherit land and things like that. It wasn't like that in 1392 since the beginning. That happened when, you know, the, the fall of the Chinese Empire, when sort of the Manchurians, the Mongolians were taking over that Korea or Chosun felt it was the last place that the Confucian culture could continue. It was the last bastion. And so therefore it got more conservative. It got more extreme. And that's when the Neo-Confucianism came. So this big sea of Confucianism, you have to be a little bit careful because it means different things to different people. And the meaning of it changed over time, right? You always be careful of isms because Isms are very broad and, and, and they don't say much. Um, spiritual culture and academic knowledge were preferred to commerce and technology in the past. So in the past, sa, long, this might be painful to watch this, sorry. 
Gong. The four occupations in the past, right? Sa Nong Gong Sang. Uh, and, and this is in order of how much the people liked them. Uh, and you notice that the Sa, the literati, yeah, the, the people that work, the educated or the people that studied, they were the, the most highly desired in traditional culture. And then the farmers or the people that harvest, the Nong, and it was the, the, the merchants, you know, the people that acted, the, the Sang, these people were the least desirable of those four. Obviously, below that, you still have, you know, nobbies and, and slaves and all things. But in the traditional culture, the people that studied were highly regarded, highly respected. And the people that sold and did money were not so much. I would say that that's flipped now. The highest paid people in Korea are certainly not the Sars. I'm not saying they should be. But I'm saying that this this order of Sanong Gongsang, the four occupations, uh, if you're a, uh, an international or foreign student looking for these, you find them under the four occupations in Wikipedia and things. These have kind of switched around and it's not like that anymore in terms of what we see. So that might be a signal of a change from uh, traditional culture to modernity. Let's continue a little bit more. These characteristics of traditional culture have been eroded and furthermore separated from contemporary culture owing to the following factors. So these things over here have gone and replaced by these things according to factors, uh, says the author. Firstly, the problem of cultural identity is caused by the experience of Japanese colonialism, which sought to eradicate and distort Korean cultural identity by the enforcement of a cultural assimilation policy at the end of the Japanese period colonial period. Indeed, the Japanese occupation may be said to have deprived Koreans of their chance of modernizing themselves beyond the traditional characteristics. Moreover, after liberation from Japan, the legacy of Japanese colonialism continued to influence the development of Korean culture in a negative way. I think we're still seeing the legacy of Japanese colonialism influencing uh, Korean policy, Korean politics, uh, Korean public discourse in a negative way in a way yeah whether you perceive it as positive or negative the legacy of uh, excuse me the legacy of Japanese colonialism is still affecting uh, South Korea it hasn't kind of moved on from that yet and there are various reasons for that um cultural identity in Korea is is hard because the Japanese at the end of the period yeah it wasn't from the beginning it wasn't from 1910 but it was later on that the Japanese did try to okay they banned the Korean language and they said that the Koreans must take Japanese names and they started changing the history books to include uh, Japanese rather than cultural things so this was a very real thing and Korean culture would have slowly gone away it would have slowly been replaced this is not particularly new or unique it's it's barbaric and horrific for korean people but it was something that's uh, over the uh, thousands of years of recorded history it's it's what happens sometimes you read machiavelli's the prince or machiavelli's discourses for his advice on how to take over people and things like that um, but a very tragic part of Korean's history. And because it was nearly taken away, then the opportunity for Koreans, it says here, may be said, so it's possible, he's not saying it in too strong language, may be said to have deprived Koreans of their chance to modernize themselves. So they'd got to one stage of their development in terms of these characteristics with with yeah and Korean culture had got somewhere it hadn't modernized yet but it had got there and then because of Japanese uh, colonization and then Japanese um, colonial rule here there was a stop and they couldn't develop more that was blocked that was hindered and that might you know cause some cultural identity shock I mean if you imagine that somebody was growing normal person but then their, their growth was just stopped at a certain point that would cause very, you know, physical, mental, cultural problems. So there's one way of looking at it. Um, 
how does the influence of Japan uh, affect k- Korean cultural identity? And the, the Han Minjok or the Minjok thing might come in because in 1945, after Japanese liberation, there would have been, there were, you know, however many people that were of mixed Korean and Japanese marriages. Okay, it wasn't like the two existed completely separate from each other for that time. So the homogeneity uh, of the Koreans is not quite as strong as it thinks. I'm not saying that it's it's all completely Japanese, but there's a lot more mixing in there, I think, than people uh, would like to accept. You have um, the things like 23andMe or 21andMe, these DNA testings that have become very popular in the West where you can get a test and you you get it sent to your house, you do this thing, you send it back and it will tell you, well, you're 40% North African, 20% Jewish, 16%, etc. And it will tell you all the breakdown of your genetic makeup and where you come from. And and people realize, wow, you know, I thought I was 100% English, born and bred. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. You would be British, not English, because English isn't a thing. Uh, but that hasn't really happened in Korea, because if it did it would really challenge uh, some of the historical narratives that are here. And also multiculturalism is coming in now, and that is also going to begin to challenge Korean cultural identity. The other one that it mentions here is uh, North Korea. As a result of the division since 1945, although the Korean people were ethnically and linguistically homogenous before the division, the last 55 years have witnessed growing differences heterogeneity between South and North Korea. These differences have taken place in the whole area of society, including language, culture and the arts. While South Korea was founded on the basis of democracy and capitalism, North Korea came to be dominated by the principle of communism and socialism. In North Korea, literature and the arts have been conceived of straightforwardly as a a means of legitimating the party's thought in North Korea. Artistic activities in North Korea are based on the North Korean brand of socialism, called Juche Thought, Juche Sasang, meaning self-reliance, Juche Jui, which was developed for the purpose of legitimating the North Korean regime of the 1960s. In this respect, North Korea continued to close its door towards arts based on capitalism and Western democracy. So the challenge between who is the real Korea exists between North and South very strongly. If we just consider the relationship with North Korea. One of the things that the two Koreas cannot agree on is the idea of history. They cannot agree on what happened in the past. Who started the Korean War and who won the Korean War? South Korea and North Korea disagree on that. They don't have the same story of history. North Korea tell its people that it essentially won the Korean War or America surrendered to it. You know, Of course, history is always written by the winners and everybody will play up their own history and play down their opponent's history. That is absolutely natural. Uh, but the two Koreas really, they're looking to be the Korea. They want to be when the international world, when the globe thinks of Korea, they don't like this question of North Korea or South Korea. They want to be the Korea. That's why when you read uh, press, when you read newspapers and things like that in South Korea, they will, a lot of the time, they won't say, and today in South Korea, they'll just say, and in Korea. Because for them, they are Korea. There is no debate. There is no other Korea. Until 1972, the capital of North Korea was... Seoul. They both claimed the territory for themselves and, and they both haven't got over that. So they want the Western world to think of Korea or they want the international world, I should say, to think that they are the Korea. So this identity, well, we're the same people, but we're also fighting for our individual distinct things. That causes a great, great cognitive dissonance. It, it's almost paradoxical and it doesn't make sense. And you still have the struggle that perhaps the most famous Korean in the world today is Kim Jong-un. 
I'm not saying he's famous because he's good or because he's achieved many things, but I mean, if you took the global population, seven odd billion, and you showed them picture of Kim Jong Un, most more people would know him than let's say uh, Bong Joon Ho or Son Heung Min. I think, right? So, obviously, among certain cultures, they're more, but Kim Jong Un is more instantly recognizable to a greater amount of people. Uh, I think. I'm not saying they would know anything about him, but they would recognize him and say, that's that guy. And that's not nice for South Korea, considering all that they've achieved economically, politically, culturally. So they're still looking for this legitimacy in the eyes. Um, of course, the North, in terms of South Korean cultural identity, what is Korea? What is modern Korea? What North Korea calls South Korea is not South Korea. It doesn't call South Korea Dehanminguk. It calls South Korea Nam Choson. To North Korea, this is still Nam Choson. This is still Choson. And that's the name that you associate with the rule from 1392 to 1905, 1910, 1897, that, that Choson dynasty period. So to North Korea, this is still uh, Nam Choson, but it's been uh, run by American powers. You know, it, it's a puppet state. I'm not saying that's true, but I'm saying that's the North Korean perception of what South Korea is. So in the beginning, I asked you, if you asked a young person, an old person, uh, a boy, a girl, rich or poor, what is modern Korea? They would give you all different answers. If you ask North Korea, and there's 25 million people in North Korea who are essentially Koreans, right? What is South Korea? They'll say it's Nam Choson, and it's, it's run by Americans, and they're all puppets. And they're not coming into the modern world or, or into our world of doing it ourselves. So that idea is, is still uh, something that plays on the Korean mind a lot. Thoughts on that change? Um, let's just have a look at one more, perhaps. Thirdly, Western culture, which started to permeate Korean society since the late 19th century, has spread rapidly since the Korean War of 1950. In particular, throughout the process of modernization since 1960s, Western popular culture based on capitalism and commercialism has swept the country and, as a result, has substantially affected the way of life of the people. While Western culture permeated the everyday life of the people, the traditional characteristics of the Korean culture gradually lost their influence on the way of the life of the people. The problem is that the characteristics of the Western culture differ considerably from that of the Korean traditional culture. From the Korean point of view, it has been argued that Western popular culture tends to be synonymous with commercialism, materialism, violence and sensuality as compared with the Korean traditional culture mentioned above. What was worse, the swift pace of modernization tended to increase extreme individualism and hedonism. Indeed, this trend led to a certain confusion and crisis within Korean cultural identity. Under these circumstances, one of the problems which cultural policy faced was to reshape Korean cultural identity and simultaneously to lessen the negative impacts of the increasing inflow of Western culture. So this is, you know, flows nicely in from what North Korea, how North Korea views South Korea, that it's been sort of taken over by the West, which I think is a little bit uh, disingenuous because um, North Korea doesn't have too many problems with the West. It has a problem with America's history, but North Korea like dollars. Uh, North Korea trying to get as many dollars as they can, and the elites in Yangban, especially the Kim family, Chairman Kim Jong-un has Dennis Rodman, uh, who is as big a symbol of commercialism, materialism, sensuality, extreme individualism and hedonism as you can imagine and uh, Kim Jong-un invites him for parties and things up on his yachts so uh, it doesn't have any too much problems with these I would say but how has Western culture influenced South Korean cultural identity because if South Korean or if Korean cultural identity is based on those traditional values are Western values the opposite and if Korea becomes more commercial material uh, individualistic hedonistic 
is it becoming more Western? Is it losing that element of Koreanness, or is it just becoming more modernized? Now, sometimes people uh, will equate rightly or wrongly, perhaps wrongly, with Westernism with modernization. What do you mean? Do you mean it's Westernized or it's modernized? You need to try to get uh, what you understand to be a difference between those two concepts. What is westernization? What or is it globalization? What is modernization? When we mean mod is modernization something that has been defined by the west and therefore they've put their own values in there. Because the idea is let's say perhaps of individuality, the idea of uh, democracy these things didn't just come out of nowhere, like from the sky. You can trace their epistemological developments. Uh, if you look at sort of, you know, the sovereignty of nations from the Treaty of Westphalia, where nations were given, they didn't have to live with each other. They didn't have to live in a hierarchy. Uh, that happened in the West. In, here in the East, you know, they all sort of lived in a hierarchy where this is the ildung, idung, samdung, okay, you're there, you're the big brother and I'm the little brother. Just like you have it in society. In society in South Korea, you know, people have a hierarchy. They're in the ketung. ketung. They're in the, the hierarchy and you know that I'm below this person, but I'm above this person. That's how it used to work among nations here. So different developments, they come from different points. When we talk about countries modernizing are we talking about them westernizing or is that not correct obviously there's going to be a, an immediate um, apprehension towards that idea because it sounds ethnocentric and it doesn't sound nice because uh, Korea needs to have uh, historical subjectivity and autonomy it needs to be in control of its own thing of its own direction and its own path so how much has Western culture influenced Korean identity? What is left of Korean identity? Is it all Korean identity? Um, can the two coexist? I mean, you only have to look at Korean society today to see people wearing jeans, watching basketball uh, and speaking English and doing these things, things that you would normally associate with the West. Mm, or maybe it's an element of glocalization that you might see where um, it's a really long word to write where global trends are brought into a so like local and global makes glocalization where sort of trends from outside are brought in but then they are adopted uh, by the incoming cult by the the culture here and they're made Korean so that's something to consider. There's a lot more in this paper, but I think, you know, for now, I don't want to give you too much because I've given you some challenging ideas. We could continue to, to read through it, but here you have a history of Yi Sung Man and Park Chang Hee and Chan Duan. Now, Kim Young Sam, I'm sure many of you know those things. If you don't, you can read that. There are better books and things out there, but it was this that I wanted to sort of start challenging your idea of what. Um, modern means and what Korea means because it's something that you've taken for granted perhaps so um, just to recap you know this is where I've been asking you to focus your attention on two areas one and two don't take these for granted you know try to really understand what these two mean what do they include? What do they exclude? How have they developed over time? What have been the factors that influenced these two things being where they were? So if that's time and these are the what what are some of the factors? And you probably come up with your own ideas. That paper that we just read, uh, that was written in 2002. So 18 years since then, there's a lot that's happened. Maybe you can fill in some more gaps so <clears throat> uh, they're the first ideas what I'm going to do now uh, is just tell you what I'd like you to do going forward and uh, to do that I will go to uh, <laughs> press all my buttons at the right time 
I'll go to the Solio de E-Class system. Let's see if I'm still logged in. Nope. So obviously the, the E-Class system, I hope you're getting used to it. I'm still trying to, to get used to it myself. Um, in case you do have any questions, any problems, uh, you'll find my email address there. You'll find my mobile number there. You can contact me any way you like or, or through this, and uh, I'll help you as best I can. That's totally no problem. So what I would like you to do now is, uh, this is our E-Class page. I'm still getting used to this, so if I do something wrong, please uh, understand me and forgive me. Um, there will be an online lecture, which uh, will be week one. That will go from the 16th, Shibyukil Puto Ishibyil Kaji, to the 22nd, Monday to Friday, I think that is, something like that, or Monday to Friday anyway. And, and just go in there and click your attendance on that, okay? So you have the week to do it. You've already watched this lecture, so please click on your attendance. Um, the materials will be in here, so this video, the reading material is there. This video will be a YouTube link uh, from this channel, from my channel here, uh, will be a YouTube link here. And then you will have an assignment to complete. So let's just very quickly talk about the assignment, which will feature here. For the assignment for this class, I'm going to ask you to present some of your thoughts on what you've experienced or what you've heard today. In class, we would be discussing this, and it would be great because you would hear the opinions of 30 other people. You would hear the opinions of your classmates, and they might be international students from different areas, and it would really challenge you because you would realize that, wow, not everybody thinks the same thing as me. Maybe I need to reevaluate my ideas. That's the beauty about uh, classwork like this, that you can understand that your ideas and your opinions will be challenged by other people. We don't quite get that, but hopefully here we'll start working towards it. So um, you need to present your ideas. I'd like you to consider two things. You need to put descriptive and normative statements. Okay, so you have descriptive and normative statements. Start with descriptive. Right? Descriptive statements are what the text says or what I say. So. Uh, the text, a descriptive statement would be this, just very briefly. In the text, Cultural Identity and Cultural Policy in South Korea by Hak Sun Yim, it said that Korea is a homo homogenous nation, right? That's what he said. That's descriptive. It's just factual describing what you read. Or you could say, in the lecture video, uh, Professor Tizard said, all this happened. That's just a descriptive statement. Now, a normative statement is when you give your, like, jugon joguro, where you give a subjective opinion, you give an interpretation of that. In the text, it said that Korea has been a homogenous nation. And although I agree with that, I think it's changing these days because of multiculturalism. Descriptive, normative. Make sense? In the video, Professor Tizard said that uh, Japanese colonialism was pretty bad, especially towards the latter half when they took away the names. I really agree with this. We need to change, or I really disagree with him. Change. Descriptive, normative. If your work is all descriptive, it's like a Wikipedia page. It's, it's boring. There's nothing in there. It might all be correct and factual, and it shows that you understand, that you paid attention. Brilliant. But we need normative so if it's all descriptive it's a bit empty if it's all normative well i think this and i think this and there's nothing no reference to any of this then we don't know that you understand we don't know that you did the work you could just be at home you know things out of your head so you need some references to the text to demonstrate that you did the work the balance of these two things doesn't need to be 50 50 can be whatever you want okay doesn't need to be fit. you can just have a couple of this and then a lot of that or but just balance it however you think is best you don't have to do a lot of work here 
my suggestion would be just pick one thing or two things that interested you and give your thoughts on that. Not on everything, one or two things. If you can, maybe focus a little bit on the ideas of modern or Korea in there somewhere. Okay, how do you present this? How do you do this work? You have three options, I would suggest, and you know, it's completely up to you what you do. The first thing is you could write this down. Uh, you know, open up your pad, do what you do, write it down, put it on a, a file and put it there. So you could write your opinions on this. You could do an audio file. So you could have looked at all this. You could be looking at your screen. You could pick up your phone and press, uh, you know, voice recorder and say, OK, well, I've just finished. My name is Kim Joo Hee, student number one, two, three, four, five. And I've been reading this and he said this and I, I think this that would also be acceptable. Third option is you could do something like this with a video with a link. I suggest that because maybe online learning might be here for some time. You don't have to do this. You might hate the idea. That's fine. But for some of you, if you have the technology or if you want to get used to doing this, might be a good way to start developing your online learning habits as well as your speaking. Uh, that's another way. Most importantly, you have three options how you do it. Writing, speaking or video. So I'm hoping that that's generous for you and that allows you to use your skills as you feel best so once you've done that uh, try to put it up in this assignment place it should work um, focus to focus if you can on the quality while, rather than the quantity don't worry about doing so much because i have to go through them all but worry about trying to do something that's you know you think is good according to your level of English ability. Um, okay, so that's what we've done for now. If you have any questions or comments about anything, if you're confused, obviously feel free to contact me. I'll, I'll help you as much as I can. And we'll get through it. Until then, I hope that you stay happy, stay healthy, and I really look forward to seeing you soon. Okay, thank you.